Okay, it's a pleasure to be here. Bonsoir. So I, nice to see lots of old friends. Um, so I've decided to give a provocative talk, and uh, it has some technical content, but I, I had a different talk on optimization and sampling. Uh, I, I resisted up, for, up until 30 minutes ago because there's uh, some new results there that shows that under certain conditions that sampling can be faster than optimization. And I wanted to speak in front of Francis Bach and present that result, and, um, but I've, I've resisted. But I, just, I now have made advertisement that that result exists. Um, okay, so this is going to be opinionated. Uh, I hope you don't mind, but I have some opinions on what's really happening these days and what's been happening for the last 40 years. So let me start with my version of history, um, which is, I think, a little different than the one that others are promulgating. Uh, first of all, this is kind of an industry-oriented uh, uh, history, um, that uh, this field, which is really just statistics, it really is, with some algorithms, um, has had a big impact in industry going back 30, 40 years. Um, so um, Amazon would not have been Amazon if they hadn't been able to model supply chains, if they hadn't been able to do fraud already back in about 1995, okay, at scale. And so there's not that much difference from what we're seeing now, okay. It was, it was at scale of the time and the computers were not as, quite as big, but it was, it, was, it was major. And Jeff Bezos was smart enough to put like 100 people in the, in the fraud detection and supply chain modeling team in about 1995, okay. Uh, after having done that, he realized he had all the infrastructure to start to also do other things with the, the, the machine learning architectures of the time and re recommendations. This is, of course, sort of the next big success story. So turn it towards the human. All right. So these were sort of little platforms and they were like just data analysis in some sense. I think what's really happening now is not that neural nets are so great and all that. It's really that we're able to now build end-to-end -end things which are uh, commodities, you know, so speech can be a commodity. You can use it inside of other things. That wasn't true uh, five or ten years ago. Um, but I'm more excited about something else, which I don't think is just building um, pattern recognition systems. Um, it's really building decision-making systems and doing that in a much broader context that we've been thinking about. So that's what we try to focus on. All right, before I get there, however, as you've noted up here, I don't tend to like the phrase AI. I think that we were doing just fine with our other words and somebody decided to use AI for what we do. It wasn't me. It wasn't people in our field. It was out, people outside of it. Um, and I don't like it, so um, I'm going to say a little bit why. So what is intelligence? First of all, none of us know. It, it is still a huge mystery with how the human brain thinks and what intelligence is. We can have systems that look like they do something intelligent, but mostly they're just faking it. They're mimicking something in, in the data. All right? So um, let's just think about it for a minute, though. What intelligence systems currently exist? Um, arguably, computers are not intelligent. They were designed by intelligent people and they can aid in intelligence, but they're not. Well, you know, these are clearly, if you're up on Mars looking down at the Earth, you see brains and minds. They're clearly intelligent. It's a mystery, uh, but they are. Uh, but what else? Is that it on the, on the planet? You know, I'll include maybe a few animals here, but um, other than that, it's just biology. Let you think about it for a minute. If you're up on Mars and you're looking down at the Earth, what do you see that's intelligent? Yeah, well, maybe it's just staring at you, but um, I once read a novel by a guy named Zola, and it was called Le Ventre de Paris, and it was about all the food that comes into Paris every single day. Every piece of lettuce, every fruit, there's a huge dance done of carts and trucks and buses and you know, planes and all that, uh, bringing every food item to the right place at the right time so that every restaurant has the ingredients it needs to make all of its dishes, and every house has all the food and so on, and every store is stocked. And that works every day, 360 years, no matter what. It's extremely intelligent, extremely robust, extremely adaptive. All right. So if you're looking down from Mars, these things are really one of the most intelligent things there is. It's at least as intelligent as this. All right. And there are principles under, you know, much more well understood for these than there are for these. We have some idea what math is here. We have no clue what the math is here. All right. And so, in fact, I've been in a department of neuroscience for about 15 years of my life, and I can tell you we just don't have any clue about how the brain is working. It's fascinating, it's, but it's super complex. Even a single neuron, we don't know how that's giving rise to thought. Networks of neurons are just, you know, it's, it's amazingly complex, you know, hundreds of years, in my view. Um, and psychology, similarly. Um, but in the meantime, we have all these things, and we're not using these ideas enough. Everyone's pointing at this, is that that's the future, or that's the present, even, in some people's view. It's just not. 
right? Here is what we're not paying enough attention to. And so we haven't, we're thinking too much about building an AI system, one that sits there in the chair and looks intelligent and does things, right? I think of that as more like a toy. It's something, you know, we sh it's a show off. What's more important is networks of systems and data that flow around and change human lives for the better or for the worse. Um, so I think that's what we really have to think about as intellectual and engineering oriented people. All right, so I wrote an op-ed this spring that sort of went through a little bit of this um, a taxonomy. I think AI is being overused. I think I, I call it an intellectual buzzword. When you don't know what you're talking about, you say AI will do it. I think Mark Zuckerberg is guilty of this. Um, and I think that we should at least start to separate out. If people are going to use the term, you know, fine, but let's separate out what some of the meanings are. So the original one was sort of 1950s, McCarthy and so on. Let's try to imitate a human in a computer. And it's, it's a philosophical aspiration. It's interesting. There's no question about it. It should go on. I got nothing against it. We just, it hadn't, we've had really no success doing it um, in 40 years. Um, and so, you know, it's still an interesting aspiration, okay? But I think that here's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more to do that I think is more interesting. In fact, in the last 40 years, there's been this IA. Now, I don't mean French version of IA. I mean intelligent augmentation, um, which has to do with the computer finding patterns and serving up information that humans can make use of to make humans more intelligent. You know, a search engine makes me more intelligent because I know the capital of every country in the world, you know, because uh, I have it at my fingertips. Um, I know all kinds of facts that I never, you know, put forth. So if you are not looking at me and you don't know that I'm typing into Google, you know, I, I come across as much more intelligent. And also, translation, which is far from being solved, it's just a string to string matching thing, you know, uh, it, it will not be solved in our lifetime, I should say, in my view. Um, nonetheless, can do string to string matching well enough that I can speak into this microphone and out can come Mandarin. All right, and it's gonna be crappy Mandarin. Um, but it'll be okay, good enough for a business purpose. I can walk around in China and get food and, you know, people can make money off of me doing that. All right, so that's all interesting. Well, so what's happened there? Well, the computer has made me more intelligent because I can communicate in any language. I didn't have that capability before. The computer makes it possible, even though it's not particularly good, all right? So those things will continue. Uh, in fact, a lot of this stuff with deep learning where you take an image and you transform it in some really amazing, cool way or take music and all that, it's not that cool by itself. It's cool in the hands of a human who will be an artist and take it as a palette for creating something ma magical. So the Matisses of the world or the Beethovens will be using that as a palette to create things. It's not interesting that the computer just made it because the computer's just searching around stupidly, right? It's, it's, it's helping human creativity. And it's just amazing to me how few people get this. They're all excited by the computer autonomously creating a symphony. It's, it's not, that's not interesting, okay? We, humans are still amazingly creative relative to what we have. And, all right. Um, and so I think this is problematic for various reasons. One is that people spend all their time thinking about pattern recognition problems and human imitation uh, and developing algorithms to do that. And that's okay. But there's lots of problems where those algorithms aren't the appropriate algorithm. Okay. And now, so, you know, p people try them and they get these problems like fairness. Oh, we didn't think about that. Well, it's because your algorithm wasn't meant to be fair. And so, but then that's going to happen again and again and again until people start taking a broader perspective on this field. All right, so another way to say it is that if you're in economics or in statistical physics, you know this well, that you can have systems do intelligent things even though every piece of it is not intelligent. And that was actually the original spirit of the neural network field, right? That the intelligence arose out of the network. But then people put a box around that and they wanted to make the intelligence be like a human being. They didn't think the broader, the network should be you know, pan-global. It should be all the distributed data sources. It shouldn't be a mind. It should be something bigger. And it could be intelligent. So that's like the Ventre de Paris. The economic system that brings food into every city around the world every day is an intelligent network. And it could be made yet more interesting and intelligent. That's where I think we're going. Also, um, people talk a lot about intelligence. They also, the second word out of their mouths is often autonomy. I want to build autonomous systems. Again, I think that's a show-off kind of thing. I want to be able to show my robot being autonomous. I'm not teaching it. I'm not doing anything. And look how smart it is. It's not that interesting to me. I think it's much more to build systems that integrate with the rest of us. So a self-driving car that's just purely autonomous is not the way to go, okay? It'll still be dangerous. A self-driving car that integrates with all the other cars around it and with the street and transmits signals and is part of a, a fabric, a network of transportation, that's interesting, hard to do, and it's going to be safe. Okay, so it's not about autonomy, it's about networking. 
All right, so what research problems come up when you think this way? Well, I'm going to emphasize some of them in this talk, but just here's some of the ones that I work on the last several years. Um, one of them that I'm going to talk about a little bit is multiple decisions. The AI perspective tends to make you think about either one decision, like a classical neural net, or a sequence, reinforcement learning. All right? But a lot of these network sort of situations, you're making hundreds of thousands of decisions simultaneously. All right? and, and those are completely different problems. Uh, systems that create markets and don't just make recommendations and have a platform, but that create some kind of interaction from, uh, between producers and consumers. How do we build such systems using data? What, what goes on there? Cloud edge interactions. This is not a classical AI problem, but it's critical. If, if you're building a self-driving car, the car has got to have some knowledge on board. It may learn that a tree has just fallen down. That won't be known in the cloud. Now there'll be inconsistent knowledge. How do you make sure that you have coherence and consistency everywhere eventually? Kind of a database problem. There's other database problems, provenance. Where did that data come from? If it came from a rumor started by one of you who told 100 people and they all came and told me, I think there's 100 independent pieces of evidence, that's wrong, okay? It's another kind of problem that you don't think about, but it's critical in building a system that really works. Um, uncertainty, abstractions, long-term goals, and so on and so forth. So um, all of these are really important and they're not so much about the pattern recognition side, they're more about the decision-making side. Um, so I think pattern wreckage is fine, but that's been the focus for many people for a long time. There's the whole second side of it, which is how do you use the pattern wreckage side and then f further proceed to actually make decisions. Okay, so let's talk about one of these problems. It's going to be very simple. Um, I won't attempt to prove any theorems here, but um, there, this is going to lead toward theorems. Um, let's think about load balancing problems. When we have scarcity, um, decisions will have to interact with each other. Right? And so that's the economic perspective. So I want to give some examples of this. So um, let's suppose, let's think about recommendation systems. So go back to classical Amazon. Um, uh, I go into Amazon, um, I enter on the website, they featureize me in some way. They put me into maybe a neural net or a random forest and out comes a recommendation that I should buy this book or that book. Right? Later Francis comes into the same site, they featureize him, goes into the same neural network and out comes a recommendation for him. Completely no relationship among those. They may recommend the same book to him and to me, and they may recommend the same book to huge numbers of people. All right? Now, if it's a movie that you're recommending, is it okay to recommend the same movie to everyone or to 100,000 people today? Um, sure, because there's no scarcity. You can copy the bits as many times as you want. What if I recommend the same book to everyone? Um, still probably not a problem, but you may not have enough inventory. Um, you may have a little bit of a delay to get the books to people. It won't be three days, maybe, but there's print on demand. Nowadays, you can print books pretty quickly. Um, all right, so there's no real scarcity there. But there's lots of real world situations where there's scarcity. So let me give you a very simple example. Let's suppose we really built a really good restaurant app. Now, I don't mean just a recommendation system that's a, you know, an advertising system that says, here's some, here's some cool restaurants. I mean that I arrive in Shanghai, I know, know Shanghai, and it's a complicated city for me. I want to pull out my cell phone, just like I do with Uber, and push a button and say, I have a request, which is I want to eat dinner now, okay? No, nothing else, right? And that request should go to all the restaurants near me, and they should look at me, featureize me, Say, okay, he's, he's from out of town, he's a certain age, you know, we know that he likes Sichuan cuisine, so certain restaurants will bid on me. Okay, just like the, the, rider, the drivers and Uber will bid, um, and they'll make me an actual offer that has value to me, and not just present me an ad. And again, I'm going to kind of say the word advertisement slightly pejoratively today, because I want to, I know where I am, but I also want to think that the advertising <laughs> company like this can start to think a little bit more broadly, because I think that it's about creating markets and not just giving people information. Um, so what I want is to actually have a, the app flash up to, to me and say, uh, for the next 10 minutes, you've got a 10% discount if you come to this Sichuan restaurant. And I look at it and say, hey, it's a pretty restaurant. It's only a couple of, it's a kilometer away. Fine, I accept. A transaction has been made. All right. Um, now we don't have a load balancing problem. Um, if I had built a, a classical recommendation system, I could have easily recommended the same restaurant to 10,000 people. Okay. All of them would go there and there'd be a line and I have created congestion. But if I build a market, I'm not going to have congestion, right? Because the uh, transaction is made, that, that kills off one seat in the restaurant, and I won't continue to recommend that seat to anybody else. All right. Let's think about another situation. What if I build an app that tells me what's the fastest way from here to the airport, and everybody really uses it, OK? Not just, it's not just a small number of people using it. That's our current situation. There's no scarcity. All right. If it, if it decides that the best way to the, the, the airport is to go down um, uh, you know, uh, Rue du Bac, 
uh, then uh, I'll go down there. But if it recommends the same street to uh, 10,000 people, um, we all go there and we've created congestion. It's no longer a good street to go down. All right. Um, all right, now there's tons of better examples. This is another one I really like. If you're in China these days, everyone has a little money. And there's all, they want to invest it for the first time in their lives. A grandmother at the rice field wants to make some, you know, some interest on, her, on her, her little bit of income. All right, so there's apps now that will give you financial uh, recommendations. All right, so what if one of them becomes really popular, which may happen, uh, and then they build a recommendation system and it recommends to that person to buy sh uh, stock in Tencent, but it recommends to 100,000 people to buy stock in Tencent. Well, the price of Tencent will go up artificially and they have now destabilized the market. All right, so this is, this is the kind of issues. Now, if you think about medicine problems and commerce problems, you can get even, you know, some better examples. These are the ones that just historically have come up in my own mind. All right, here's one I also like quite a bit. I think it gives you a picture of what the bigger story is here. Um, let's think about music, all right? Music's a wonderful form of, of human to human contact. Um, it is alive in some ways. More people are making it than ever before in history by a factor of 10. More people are listening to it than ever before in history. And there's no market. It's a shocking fact. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, there's a few famous singers, Beyonce or whatever, who are making tons of money off of it. And then the people around them. Right? But all these people are putting music up onto SoundCloud. That music is actually being listened to, but they have no idea who's listening to them. And they get no money from it. Okay? They're not in the market for their product, all right? Now, who, people do make money off of it. Um, and again, I risk uh, my host getting mad at me here, but it's sites like Spotify and Pandora. They stream it to people and they make their money off of advertising, okay? That's kind of broken because the producers and consumers, the people making the music and the people listening are not being connected in a market. It's somebody else who built the, 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 te the, like, the technology and some advertisers, and the money is going like there without going like this. Okay, so we need to fix that. How do you fix it? All right, well, it's not that hard. You, you remember that markets are created, first of all, by information flow, all right, and trust, two things. So, right, how, what information? Well, let's suppose that you're somebody who's been putting songs on SoundCloud and, um, um, uh, so I'm, I'm a company that's going to provide that information. I'm going to create the market. Uh, I'm going to do it just simply by creating a dashboard for you. So, um, you know, at the end of the week, you come home, you drive a taxi during the week. On the weekends, you make your music. So you come home on Saturday, you open up your laptop, and you have a map of all of France. And um, on that map, it's all of the people who've listened to you during the last week. So you say, uh, you know, big surprise in Grenoble, I've been listened to by 10,000 people this last week. Who knows why? Someone liked me down there and told their friends and also, but now I have some information, right? Now I can monetize that. It's not the site monet, I can monetize. Well, how? I simply go give a show down in Grenoble, all right? And there should be services, there are already, but there will be more who allow me to do that. So I go give a show down there, I make 20,000 euros, all right? I do that three times during the year, there's a salary. I can quit my taxi job, which will be going away anyway. All right? And I can have a job as a musician, not a Beyonce, but I have a job. All right? And that scales to like maybe you know, a few hundreds of thousands of people, or a million in China, or a million in the US. Every country can have its cadre of people who make music and people listen. And it's not micropayments, it's a market. And moreover, when you create a market, all kinds of other things happen. So for example, I, now that I know who's listening to me, I can say, Stefan, I know you're a big fan. Um, you want me to play at your son's wedding? Um, 10,000 euros. You're all excited because your favorite musician comes to your wedding. I'm excited because I have this audience and I make some money, right? And so on, right? Um, I can say, Francis, you want to come backstage, VIP pass to my show? <laughs> yeah. All right, but so anyway, think about the human creativity that you could unleash by doing this, not just in, in music, but other forms in journalism, uh, other forms of art. Um, think about cooking. You know, think of all the grandmothers who love to cook whose children are gone. And I would like to go home and say, push a button and say, in 30 minutes I'll be home. All the people who like to cook around me in the neighborhood are advertised that I want to eat tonight and I don't know how to cook around the time. And they bid on me and they come over to the house and cook something. There's a lot of human happiness that we're leaving on the table by not having such a network. And just having technology push things to people and have platforms where we go to and we get stuff that we don't necessarily care about really deeply. Okay, so there's a company in the U.S. doing this. It's called United Masters. If you want to see a really uh, uh, you know, visionary company, go there. 
Um, it's real famous musicians behind it, as well as real famous tech, tech people behind it. And it has a real chance of uh, it's doing this stuff. All right? And there's already many people on the, on the site, and it's creating this. And the, the musicians want it because they hate the broken market. The, for all the other young musicians, that, that, you know, they, they hate the fact that you have to go through record companies and all that. Okay, um, so that's kind of, I hope, gives you a little bit of a flavor that in all kinds of areas of human life, we could use our computer science savvy to not create services and monetize them in the classical Google style. We could create markets. Now, do you make money doing that? Um, sure, you don't have to do any advertising. If you want to do some advertising, that's okay. But you actually can just take 5% of every transaction and you can have a perfectly good business. Right? And if you do want to advertise, and again, I'm not against advertising, you could do it by, in, in particular on this site, you have the world's best demographic. You know who the people are who are listening to the, all the uh, particular up and coming artists. Right? That's way better than just having rough information from the internet that you've scraped about people. Okay, um, and now intellectually, there's huge, great, there's great issues here. This is statistics meets economics in a new way. So the, the classical way is econometrics, all right? There's algorithm and game theory, there's all there's connections, but there's not this one, which is recommendation systems meet economics, markets. So there's tons of interesting intellectual problems. All right, let me bring in a second uh, thread. So we're talking about multiple decisions here, and I hope I've convinced you this isn't reinforcement learning and this isn't a neural net. All right, this is multiple decisions in an economic sense, okay? Some, somewhat game theoretic, market design, but also new ideas are gonna be needed, all right? But there's another way that multiple decisions come in that we're not just making either one decision or a sequence, the, uh, and that's been studied a lot in statistics. It's the multiple decision FDR problem. So hopefully you've seen a picture like this before. Someone is trying to make a decision under uncertainty. They believe that they wanna test whether jelly beans cause acne. All right, so um, a, a statistician would say, well, I'll do a randomized experiment if I can. So I go gather 100 people up, I put 50 in the jelly beans uh, treatment arm and 50 who are, are uh, in the control arm. And after six months, these people eat jelly beans, these people don't, I compare their skin condition. All right, and if I'm a good statistician, I can do a permutation test or something and figure out that that's the difference I see is very likely under the null hypothesis, therefore I don't reject the null. Right? But this is never the end of it in real life. You don't just do one decision, you do many decisions because someone says, well, it's not just jelly beans, it's green jelly beans or red jelly beans or yellow jelly beans. They have a whole sequence of hypotheses they think about or not even in sequence. It could be a whole bag that everybody in your company thinks about today. So in real companies, you do like a 10,000 A-B test per day. All right? So what do you want to do? You want to make sure that you don't make an error here in some sense. All right? But you know what's going to happen here if you do this test enough by chance alone, you'll put the people who already have a bad skin condition in the jelly beans category and the others not, and you'll see that they have bad skin condition, and you will publish um, the result that green jelly beans cause acne. And then the journals will pick it up because it's exciting, it's surprising. And I think you all know this story. This is happening all the time, all right? Um, and I give talks in statistics audience, and they all say, yeah, we know about FDR and all that, but I talk, I talk outside of statistics audience, they don't even know what FDR is. False discovery rate. So let me say a couple of words about that. Um, you all know what classification is, so you know what false positives and false negatives are, but that's usually taught in the setting of making one decision at a time. What if we're making huge numbers of decisions? Here, nine, all right? And so in that set of decisions, some of them you should not make a discovery, they're null. Say some other four, you should make a discovery, they are not null. But you now have some rule, and you uh, make some discoveries. And these two are good ones, and these two are not. All right? So if you're now looking at the bag of all the discoveries you made today, uh, you would like to say, what fraction of them are bad? Well, in this case, it's two out of four, not too good. All right? So um, this criterion, called the false discovery proportion, is a ratio of two things. It's not just an accuracy or a precision or a recall. It's critically a ratio. So it goes naturally over to the case of multiple decisions. Very simple change in thinking, but very, very profound. All right, and here's a little picture, hopefully it'll convince you that um, it can really be a completely different way to think. So let's suppose I'm in a typical company, I'm doing 10,000 different A-B tests. Um, so maybe I'm deciding whether to change my website from blue to green. Someone thinks that's a cool idea, or put some extra pixels there, or something like that. Um, now most of those are not gonna get any more viewers, or you know, clicks, or whatever. Um, so maybe 100 of them really were, would be great changes to make if I can discover them, and 9,900 not. Now I'm gonna use some fancy neural net and I'm gonna get a network that has a very good 
uh, type 1 error rate, the false positive rate is 0.05. All right, so I've trained it really, really well. So now I apply it to these data, and in particular I apply it to all of these nulls where it should say null, and so only 5% of them will be wrong. So uh, 495 times I will make a false discovery out of those bag of 9,900. You know, 9, all right, now I use the same neural net and I, I ask about its power. What's the probability that on these non-nulls it says it makes a discovery, as it should? Suppose that's pretty high too, you know, 0.8, so it's a pretty good neural net. All right, so I apply it to that, those things, and I make 80 true discoveries. Now here's the problem, if you just add those up, um, you see that I made 575 discoveries today, this plus this. So I go back to my boss and say, I made 575 discoveries today. Things that we might consider changing on the website. And the boss says, well, that's pretty good, but what fraction of those are likely to be false? And I say, oh, I'm sorry to say, but 495 are false. All right, and the boss will fire you. All right, but this is a very common situation, and people just run tests without even thinking about it. Okay. Um, so anyway, if you're a statistician, you know that there's a literature on this, going back to Benjamin Hochberg and, and before, uh, and it's very rich active area, and it's exactly about this problem of multiple decisions. Um, I just want to say, so we've been working on this in my group, because I'm very interested in decision making of all kinds, um, and so we've been working on an online version of this, all right? So where you might want to first of all consider changing the color on your website, and then maybe the size, and then maybe the orientation, and so on. If you were to do tests for each one of these at some fixed alpha level, you would just start, the alpha would go down, and you would just eventually run out of alpha power, and you couldn't make any more tests. You'd be done. We'd kick you off of the island. All right? Is there a way to allow someone to keep making tests forever, through their whole lifetime? Uh, and there is, because FDR is a ratio. All right? So that ratio can be held under control if the numerator is small or if the denominator is big. That's a, that's a critical difference. All right, so um, we are going to work on a scheme that, oops, didn't get that, that's going to let the alphas vary in some way. All right, and so we're going to do this uh, in a fully um, online, anytime fashion. Here's my colleagues at Berkeley have been working on this, um, where we're going to, we're going to, you're going to make in sequences of decisions, or maybe bags, and I'm going to stop you at any time and I say, how many discoveries have you made up until now? And I say, you know, 575. What fraction of them are likely to be bad? I can guarantee always less than 0.05, no matter when you stop me. Okay, so it's basically a martingale kind of argument. Um, and with that mathematics, you can actually start to, to set these alphas in a particular way. And just to show you a picture, what happens here is, is that um, if you do a test and you don't reject the null, you lose a little alpha wealth. All right, you, I give you 0.05 alpha wealth in the very beginning, and every time you do a test and you don't reject, you lose a little bit of alpha wealth. You can't keep doing that forever. But at some point, you're going to make a discovery, and when you do, you earn wealth, because that's the denominator going up. So I will give you back some new wealth. All right, so what if you see that you're not, you're, 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 it's going, your wealth is going down, 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 down? Well, you do like any good scientist. You say, the field I'm working in, there's no discoveries left to make. I'm in a bad field. So I move to some other new field where there's discoveries to make. And I start making discoveries, and I get some more alpha wealth. And if I do that throughout my lifetime, continue to move to new fields, I can have my FDP or FDR controlled under 0.05 through my entire lifetime. All right? And a group of us can do it, too. All right, so there's algorithmic support for all of this. And I think it's critical that people start to learn to use it. Um, OK, so my little formula here, if we have to use this phrase AI, um, I want to use the broad sense of it, the II sense of it, okay? not the create the human intelligence in a computer. Let's call it data plus algorithms plus markets, because markets definitely gets the flavor that I want to get, okay? which is it about interactions, producers, and consumers, and pricing, and all those sorts of things. Okay, wherever you have data flows, make those data flows transparent and create prices associated with those data flows. You can start to create a market. Um, so, uh, you know, there should be less focus on autonomy and human intimacy skills. I mean, again, it's fine if people do that. There's just so much focus on that. I want to change that. More on federated agents, scarcity, partial information. All right. And learning is, of course, critical. Um, it's going to be the bridge between economics and, and statistics in this kind of new way of thinking. I should say this is not that new, new of a way of thinking, but just a kind of a, you know, Retilting of, of what we're doing. If you're uh, in an IT company, instead of thinking of, I'm going to provide a service on a platform and everyone's going to come there and hopefully they'll get something out of it, probably they want to pay for it, so I'll use advertising as the way to get money. You know, broaden your perspective. Create a market because if you create a market, people will come there and they'll pay. Uber is a market, it's a two sided market. All right? So the people who create Uber don't have to advertise, 
they create a market where people pay for the service because it's good enough and there's a price being set and there's, a, there's, a, there's an interaction. So do that for all kinds of other things you would like people to, and to use. Okay? Anytime it's really something people really want to use, there should be a price for it, including their data. All right. Um, so how am I doing on time? I'm oh, still okay. Um, yeah, five minutes, perfect. So uh, let me just go back to this list here. I've kind of hinted at or alluded to a few of these topics. Um, I do also want to say something about the software side of all of this. Um, mostly I've become a mathematician the last few years because I think there's too few people doing the math. Um, but I also believe in building systems and really doing them at scale. So I want to tell you a little bit about a project at Berkeley called Ray. Uh, if you know about Spark, in some sense this is meant to be go beyond Spark. So this is meant to be distributed programming in Python. Uh, for solving problems where there's lots of heterogeneous workloads. So if you go down a search tree, for example, you have maybe 10,000 threads going down the search. Some of them will end very quickly, because you very quickly realize it's a bad idea. Some of them will end much later. If you did that in Spark or MapReduce, you'd have to wait till all the threads finished, and then you do another round. All right, so we want something that's much more adaptive. Um, you know, hyperparameter optimization and so on is, is kind of a motivating situation for us. Okay, so again, focusing not on the, you know, TensorFlow, that's the pattern recognition side, fine. Focusing on this decision side. We need a, a software architecture to support that. All right, so let me just show a couple of cartoons about what we're thinking about here. Um, you know, the current ecosystem is that there's, 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 you know, software for training, for serving, streaming, distributed, RL, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, if, if you get to the point where you want to move beyond a single laptop and go to a distributed version, you write a distributed version of that. And so there's been a lot of software where people have done that. Um, but now you have to glue all this together, and the distributed model may not be very coherent across all of these things. All right, so what we aim is to provide a platform that does all the distributed stuff, the scheduling, the moving the objects around, the coherence, and so on, so that these things just become libraries on top of it. Okay, so another way to say this is that if you look at a modern programming language, um, back in my day it was just C, um, but then functional programming kind of came back and then objects became popular, and then a modern language like Python arose to do both, it has objects and functions, all right? But when things went distributed, uh, in, in uh, MapReduce in particular, it became just purely functional. So MapReduce, those are functional calls, there's no state. And the fact that there's no state in MapReduce was a real problem. Spark kind of aimed at circumventing that, but it didn't really quite solve it. It didn't make it back into a language. All right, so what we really want to do is to have a modern version of Python that's completely distributed. You can run it on 10,000 processors, uh, and you can have both functions and objects, because we know in programming languages you need both. And then we will work behind the scenes in Ray to ensure that it's all done seamlessly. You don't have to think about any of that. All right, so um, our Architecture is going to have a layer where there's tasks and actors, i.e. functions and objects, distributed. And there's an object underneath which coordinates all of it. So let me show you briefly the API. It's just Python. So here's a typical little bit of Python code running on one laptop. I define a vector and I do a dot product. Let's suppose I want to tell the system, you can now run that on 10,000 processors. Uh, all I do is decorate it with ray.remote. And then when I call these things, I call the remote version. So zeros.remote creates this on some processor somewhere. Uh, ID2 is on some other processor. I do the dot product somewhere. And then the only synchronization step is when I do a ray.get. So this is not MapReduce where I synchronize explicitly. It's done when I need the data. Similarly, on the object side, uh, here's a classic little counter object, uh, uh, increments of value. I might say I'm going to run it remotely. I even tell you how many GPUs I want. Um, oops, didn't mean to do that. Um, and then I again call it remotely. All right, so there's a project at, um, actually before I go there, here's the architecture. So this exists on GitHub, it's in beta right now. Uh, it's being used around the world and even in production in some companies. Um, uh, it has a huge amount of attention to object stores, object managers, schedulers, and, um, and so on, done in a distributed uh, fault tolerant way. Um, here's a project at Berkeley which is using this, and it's, it's an, an interesting test case. I'll mention this and I'll finish. Um, this is um, Alex Bayen's group working on transportation. Um, so they're solving massive PDEs and stochastic PDEs to model real transportation, real car flow in a city. And they want to see how does traffic arise and how to mitigate it and so on. So they built a whole big simulator to do this. Uh, and I won't get into any of the details, but it's their, their serious civil engineers who did this. All right, and here is their simulator running. 
on so real traffic patterns, solving these PDEs and everything. And if I can get over here to show you this thing running, if I can get the mouse. There we go. All right, so it runs for a while, and traffic starts to build up here. And that puts stress on the PDE solver, the coupled PDE solver across multiple machines. And as it runs and runs and runs, it starts to slow down, and then eventually it just stops. Okay, the, the, it just, it, it, you know, it's a, a big blockage. So then they restart it, reboot it, and try again, and it still stops. So they came to us and said, can you help us? And we said, yes, you need to be trying Ray. So um, we gave them Ray. They changed two lines of their code, their Python code, and they reran it. And I'll show you the simulation of Ray doing this. It's a little simpler highway, but uh, there's already congestion right in the very beginning. You can see all these cars backed up, but there's a little bit of flow, cars are still getting through. Um, and this runs for four hours with no problems. Okay, never ever stops. And this is being done on a elastic network and it's just doing all the work. They just changed two lines of Python code. All right, and then they were able to do kind of curves that they could plot and send to their papers and so on. Here we go. Um, okay, so there's a community developing around this. It is open source. Uh, here's its adoption. Um, as of May 2017, it was there. Now it's up to here. Uh, here's some of the companies that have devoted headcount to this, uh, Intel, OpenAI, Ericsson, and so on, and I'm particularly proud of Ant Financial. I spend time in China, and they've developed 15, uh, devoted 15 headcount to this, Ray. It's the first Chinese company to do open source development. All their code is sitting there on GitHub. It's kind of amazing. Um, and it's being used in production, Ant Financial. If you know anything about Ant Financial, you, you know, you were talking about numbers earlier. Ant Financial's numbers will beat yours. I mean, it's amazing how many numbers are going there. So they're, they're running it, and this is kind of the kind of curve that uh, helped convince them. If we get up to like 60 nodes, this is number of tasks per second. There's, you can get up to a million tasks per second just on 60 nodes. So this is a, kind of the real thing. Uh, it's being talked about at OSDI tomorrow uh, in San Diego, and now we all acknowledge all the uh, colleagues here. Uh, Philip Moritz and Robert Nishara are my students. Um, Jan Stoika at the end here is the um, uh, um, lead senior author. He is the developer, one of the developers of Spark, and you know a major systems person. And he and I have been collaborating for years now, and this is kind of our flat, last shiny, shiny project. Okay, so I'm now finished. Um, let me just return to my high level. I hope I've kind of uh, given you some food for thought about this human imitative AI. Um, again, I don't think it's bad. I don't want to bash it per se. I just don't think, I think we're talking about it too much. Um, I also wrote that op-ed when I kind of noticed that some companies were advertising themselves as we figured out how the human brain works, uh, AlphaGo. Um, <laughs> and therefore, we can do all kinds of amazing things. Give us lots of money. And that kind of somehow dishonesty just grated on me, and it still does. Okay, we haven't figured out how the human brain. We're not going to. We don't need to, though because there's so many interesting things we can do, and we can make life better for human beings. We can make things, you know, data and, and utilities merge. We can do it in real time. We can be transparent and secure and all that. And we have so much to do there. It's so hard. So I think of this kind of like the development of a new engineering field, chemical engineering in the 40s or 50s. Before that, they just had chemistry. You know, you could pour a few things together and you could create a few materials. They said, we could do this at scale. We create brand new materials for every human being right, and make life better. And they did. Um, you know, there's problems, there's externalities, and so on, because it's real. They really did something. And they created a whole field called civil engineering, or chemical engineering. It didn't exist before, right? That's really what's happening right now, is we're taking our proto-principles and kind of gluing them together in more or less ad hoc ways and creating systems that sometimes bring value and sometimes don't. But we don't have the engineering discipline yet. We don't have a field called whatever you want to call it. If you want to call it AI, that's fine, but I'd prefer something else. All right, thank you.